Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Avenging Varus the Germanic Wars Part 1, The Campaigns of Tiberius by Invicta. I know a lot of you have been wanting this for a while, and we are finally getting to it. I am very excited to go through this series. If you guys end up enjoying this episode, I would appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below, and will give you access to regular exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this video. The devastating defeat of the legions at Teutoburg would be etched into the Roman psyche and haunt their nightmares for centuries to come. Yeah. When people spoke of the Varian disaster, they did so with venomous words, cursing the barbarians who had wrought such a tragedy upon them. Now this series is going to be about the Roman response to the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, but I hope we get an opportunity to talk about how truly devastating that defeat was. For the Romans, such a humiliating affront could not go unpunished. The Empire lived and died by its martial reputation. It would have its vengeance. Mm. Today, let us embark on the campaigns to avenge Varus and his legions. Yep. You too can march through the lands of Germania with the documentary Aerial Odyssey Germany from Above. Available for streaming now through our sponsor Magellan TV. Alright. And you guys know the deal. Uh, please go and check out this video by Invicta. It is linked down below. Go and give them a like, subscribe to their channel, check out their sponsor, show them support for making these fantastic videos. For buy one, get one free gift card for an annual membership by clicking the link in the description. Enjoy. When the death blow was struck to the legions trapped in the Teutoburg forest, news quickly spread back to the remaining legionary forces stationed on the Rhine frontier. For those on duty, it must have been an eerie sight as survivors trickled in from the forests, painting an ever-worsening picture of the disaster. As the full scope of the defeat began to take form, riders were quickly dispatched back to the capital. This was done by way of the new Cursus Publicus. Right, and so just to clarify, the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, or Teutoburg Forest as they're pronouncing it, in 9 AD, what actually happened? Basically, a Roman force under Varus, of course this whole series is titled Avenging Varus, was defeated by a Germanic alliance under Arminius, who was a Roman-educated, Roman-trained German. He had served in the Roman army, I believe he even had Roman citizenship, and so he had that training, he had that education, and he was able to pretty skillfully defeat this Roman force a truly devastating defeat, and really did make Romans very afraid <laughs> of the German tribes for a long, long time to follow. So, that's what we're talking about here. That is the devastating defeat that this whole series is going to be a response to. A communication network which connected the provinces of the Empire to its administrative center through the use of roads, way stations, and dedicated couriers. If the defeat at Teutoburg were carried by horse, it would have traveled around 60 kilometers per day and arrived in Rome within three to four weeks. If a horse relay was used, this speed would have been closer to around 200 kilometers a day, with the message arriving in about two weeks. In either case, the rider bearing the important news would have attached a feather to his spear, indicating the haste of his mission. Mm. Not far behind the bearer of bad news would be another grim portent, the severed head of Varus himself. Yeah, and by the way, this is something else we see not only in Roman history, but a lot of ancient history, and really any sort of pre-modern history, is that when you kill somebody, and you want it to be known that you've killed them, you will send their head around. Because, ask yourself, how exactly can you confirm that someone has been killed? I mean, with 100% accuracy. Sure, I mean, look, there's the fact that, look, they won't show up, There'll be witnesses that they've been killed. Of course, all of that is confirmation, but true 100% confirmation can only come from having the head. <laughs> if you have someone's head, well, you will 100% know that they have been killed. Which had been sent by the Germanic tribes. As one might imagine, this raised quite the panic back in Rome. Was a vast barbarian host now bearing down on Italy? Would the nightmarish tales of old repeat themselves and see Italy in flames? Yeah, and it's worth thinking about the context within which this is occurring. And by the way, 
we have a reaction to the Battle of the Tudeberg Forest, uh, a video by Story Civilis, so I'll put that up in the corner. You can check that out. But the context is we are during the reign of Augustus, and we're actually pretty close to the end. Now, that may not have been clear at the time, though it was clear that Augustus was getting pretty old, but for decades now, Rome has been in a state of peace and prosperity, the so-called Pax Romana that had begun under Augustus. Uh, and Augustus came to power on the back of years of civil wars, not just between him and Mark Antony, but between them and the assassins of Caesar, between Caesar and Pompey, Rome had gone through this period of intense chaos and violence, but at this point, there had been decades of peace, prosperity, wealth, culture, uh, an explosion of Roman wealth and culture, frankly. And so this was a bit of a shock to the system, uh, because not only had it been a period of peace and prosperity for the Romans, but the Roman Empire had been expanding. Now, <laughs> if you were someone who Roman legions were expanding into your land, obviously this wasn't a period of peace for you. This is from a very Roman perspective, but the empire had been expanding, right? And so this was a real shock, a real surprise, created a real scar on the Roman psyche. This era of peace, success, conquest has been rudely interrupted by this shocking, what the Romans would have seen as, barbarian victory. And so you can imagine how panic and fear would be quickly inflamed. Our legions have been defeated. Are the barbarians going to march south? Are they going to march to Italy, to Rome? Are they going to sack the city? What's going to happen? Now, of course, all of this was broadly over-exaggerated, and that would become very quickly clear. But it's not hard to imagine how people would be afraid. To the more level-headed, such a scenario was not given much credence. Right. However, there certainly was a plausible threat of attack. Anytime Rome bled, this invited its enemies to take advantage of its real or perceived vulnerability. Yeah, and I'm glad they're showing this map right now. When you're an empire that stretches this far and wide, it's not hard to imagine that you would have a lot of enemies. There are a lot of different states, tribes, and people who are waiting for the Romans to show just a bit of vulnerability, and then they'll attack, they'll invade, they'll rebel. I mean, there are a lot of different peoples living under the Roman Empire at the moment, and while some of them are loyal to the Roman state, a lot of them are just biding their time, waiting for an opportunity to rise up. So that sort of adds to the fear and the panic, even though, like they said, you know, if you're a more level-headed, realistic, you know that this one defeat will not lead to the sack of the city or anything that crazy, but it could invite more challenges, more violence, and more danger to the Empire. Who knew which tribe would now launch raids, which foreign king would now plan for invasion, or yeah. which populace would rise up in rebellion? Exactly. Recall that just a few years ago, the Great Illyrian Revolt had seen a reported one million rebels erupt upon Rome's doorstep. Wow. Only through the greatest concentration of force seen in decades, and some good luck, was the disaster averted. And now, just as the last embers of that conflagration were being stamped out, the news of Teutoburg had arrived. It's Yeah, and this is a situation where the disaster hasn't been averted, the disaster has already happened. And that's why I think this is sort of an interesting series. There's a lot of content on the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest itself. This deals with the aftermath. So, the disaster has happened. The defeat has happened. Now Rome has to deal with the aftermath. How do they respond to that disaster? It's no wonder the typically stoic Augustus began to crack under the pressure. Mm. According to Suetonius, quote, He was so greatly affected that for several months in succession, he cut neither his beard nor his hair, and sometimes he would dash his head against a door, crying, Quintilius Ferris, give me back my legions. Yeah, that is a really famous line. Ferris, give me back my legions. That is one of the lines that has been immortalized from this whole thing. Now, with all pieces of Roman history, especially when we have specific quotes, did Augustus actually say this? We don't know. He might have. He might not have. This could be a word put in his mouth by historians. This is true for most quotes we have from Roman history, but I do think it accurately displays the situation and how he was feeling. Augustus, civically, a very level-headed, cold, calculating guy, you can see how this defeat shook even him. 
As for taking immediate action, it seems that the Empire's first order of business was to assume a defensive posture in anticipation of the next body blow. Augustus set up watches throughout Rome, extended the tenures of the provincial governors, and began to mobilize his forces. Mm. Meanwhile along the Rhine, General Lucius Nonius Aspranus, none other than the nephew of Varus, immediately repositioned his two legions, the 1st Germanica and the 5th Aladai, to secure the fortresses leading to Gaul. In Germania, Arminius was busy plotting his next move with the Germanic tribes. They knew they had stunned Rome for a brief moment, and must do something with the precious time at hand. Yeah, Arminius isn't done yet. Once again, Arminius is so often talked about in the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, that is the context within which he is seen, that we don't usually think about what happened to him afterwards. And in that series, in this series, we're going to see that. And you can see the Romans are going to this defensive stance, and at this point, and frankly from this point onwards, the Rhine River will sort of be that border between Germania and Rome. You know, what the Romans would see as civilized Roman country and barbarian territory. And that will continue through the collapse of the Roman Empire. There will be multiple incursions into German territory, some of which we're going to see uh, in this series, some of which were absolutely very successful, but that border along the Rhine River will basically stick. It appears that they immediately went about wiping out the remaining Roman presence east of the Rhine. Settlements were cleansed, outposts seized, and fortresses stormed. All but one garrison, the Fort of Aliso, fell. Here, the Germanic waves crashed upon the defenders, but failed to dislodge them, taking heavy casualties in the process. For now, the tribes retreated to a safe distance and opted to starve out the Romans. Yet during a stormy night, the defenders actually managed to flee to the Rhine, leaving the last imperial holding in Germania to be plundered. When the Damn. tribes next att- I mean, look, good move, I would say. <laughs> you want to get back across the Rhine River. You know, I really think there's this image that develops in the Roman consciousness very much associated with this defeat of, you know, like I said, west of the Rhine River, even if it's Gaul, even if there's a bunch of these sort of non-Roman types, uh, the Romans could be very xenophobic, still it was civilized, the Gauls were Romanized, all this sort of stuff. And then east of the Rhine River is this sort of dark barbarian forest you know, that you walk through fearful of who's watching you from a distance, that really is the image that implants itself into the mind of the Roman people. And so, like I said, that Rhine River becomes the border because east of the Rhine, well, that's a scary, dangerous place. And when we talk about this sort of warfare, this is brutal, brutal stuff. You know, when Rome is conquering, really, any sort of people, they're brutal. You know, there's a lot of massacres, selling people into slavery, burning towns... And when tribes fight back, in this case Germanic tribes, they are also extremely brutal. They're not just wiping out Roman soldiers, but they're wiping out entire Roman settlements. Uh, that, in of course, includes civilians. They want Roman presence completely gone from their territory. So this is a very cruel, brutal style of warfare. Attempted to move against Gaul, however, they found themselves blocked by the reformed Roman defenses. No significant invasion was attempted, as it became clear that Rome was beginning to regain its footing. Better to retreat for now and prepare for the harsh days of warfare ahead. Unfortunately, such a shift in momentum undermined their cause. In the run-up to Teutoburg, the tribes had found unity of purpose as they all strove towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. Yet in the aftermath, once victory had been achieved, the fault lines between the tribes re-emerged when it came to plotting a course for the future. Longtime rivals of Arminius also fought against his plans. Yeah, and this is one of the issues that we saw with Gaul. I think Gaul is probably the best example to draw on because if we think about Gaul, uh, it was really conquered by Julius Caesar. Now, there was already Roman occupation, but if you want to look at the one man most responsible for conquering Gaul and bringing it into the Roman Empire, that would be Caesar. Of course, the uncle and adopted father of Augustus. And yes, Rome has occupied Gaul for decades and decades at this point, but in the grand scheme, it hasn't been that long. So I think when we talk about the Germanic tribes, Gaul is the best point of reference. And one of the issues that these Gallic tribes kept running into is that they struggled to unify. Now, we can look at examples of times when they did unify, and they found some success, though when you're fighting against Julius Caesar, 
that can be pretty difficult. You might think about Vercingetorix. He was a strong leader. The Gauls unified to a certain extent under him. He was still eventually defeated. The Germans, they did unify under Arminius. They had a similar situation. This sort of powerful, intelligent, skilled leader who was familiar with the Roman way of doing things, they unified under him. Now that alliance is starting to crack, and now they risk going the way of Gaul. Now, like I said, Roman expansion will basically stop at the Rhine River. But at this point, that was not at all clear. No one would have known that for hundreds and hundreds of years, the Romans really wouldn't be able to extend much further. They just faced this significant devastating loss, but I think in the minds of many Romans, this was still a lot of open territory, and they were going to go back, defeat the Germans, show them what's what, and then take their territory. For instance, Segestes of the Cherusci would form a pro-Roman coalition, while Morobotus of the Marcomanni refused to take his side or offer any assistance. Right. Once Rome shook off the effects of the initial trauma, its thoughts turned to vengeance. <laughs> but who would serve as the harbinger of Rome's wrathful justice? For Augustus, the choice was simple. His champion would be none other than his most trusted general and adopted son, Tiberius. Mm -hmm. The man was an extremely capable commander who had once again proven his worth in decisively crushing the Great Illyrian Revolt. Crucially, Tiberius also had extensive experience fighting the Germanic tribes, having led multiple campaigns against them in the last decade. In fact, he had even been planning a massive campaign into Germania, involving 12 legions just a few years prior to Torteberg. Yep, Tiberius had some experience earlier in his career. Now, look, Tiberius, who will be the next Roman Emperor, I mean... We'll get to that. Him and Augustus had a bit of an off-and-on relationship. Throughout most of his life, Tiberius was not the number one pick to succeed Augustus. <laughs> Augustus, frankly, had a series of options who he preferred better. But it ended up that Tiberius was the heir. And Tiberius, though... Look, you can talk about his emperorship. There were pros and cons. He was definitely not the best emperor. He was fairly capable and at least qualified for this job, so he is going to begin this process of Rome getting revenge. He will not end it, but he will begin it. Before those plans were scrapped to deal with the uprising in Illyria. If one could find any fault with him, it was perhaps that he was slow to move. Hmm. Not out of any fear of battle, but out of a dedication to the principles of methodical, logistics-based warfare meant to grind the enemy down with minimal losses. Friend of Tiberius and historian Valeus Petercullus relays how the general's belief was that, quote, the least risky course was the most glorious. Right. In addition, he states that. Yeah, Tiberius was this sort of methodical fellow who really emphasized discipline in military affairs. Uh, so, you know, there's a couple of different ways of looking at things, right? I mean, the Romans did like their discipline, they did like to be methodical, but. There was also that more adventurous streak of Roman military philosophy. You know, be brave, run forward, charge into danger. Tiberius represented the more methodical, disciplinarian side of things. Then he did the charge into danger type attitude. Now, of course, I'm sure the best Roman generals combined those two traits, but some had more one than other. The Tiberius shared in the hardships of his troops, ate with them, and saw to their safety above all else. Right. For this... He was beloved by the men. Thus, when Tiberius was sent to Germania by Augustus in 10 AD, it is this cautious approach that he adopted. The most immediate objective was to stabilize the frontier, which had been thrown into chaos by the Varian disaster. The death of three legions had left a gaping hole in the defenses, which were being further exploited by Arminius and his coalition of tribes. To combat this threat, Tiberius set about bolstering the Rhine by bringing the total count of his legions up to eight and redistributing these across the area's key fortifications. Next, he turned from a defensive stance to an offensive one. Mm. After all, a good offense makes a great defense. This was especially true on the frontier regions of Rome, where signs of strength by the legions served as strong deterrents against would-be attackers. In these matters, Tiberius chose to send a most brutal of messages. When he launched retaliatory raids across the border, everything in the path of the Roman army was burned to the ground. Yeah. Like I said, this is brutal, brutal fighting from both sides. I mentioned how the Germans would do things and also how the Romans would do things. And it's the same situation here. They cross over the Rhine. They're burning down villages. 
massacring innocent people, maybe selling them into slavery. Brutal stuff. And every person was sold into slavery. Yeah. There were no crops, no villages, no animals that survived. According to our sources, so careful was Tiberius in his approach that not a single Roman died. This was total war at its essence. Yeah, okay, that is most likely over-exaggerated. Roman historians, along with putting words in the mouths of important people, they also over-exaggerated sometimes. So, you know, if you're looking at, say, Julius Caesar and him writing about his battles with different Gallic tribes, he will usually way over-exaggerate the number of enemies he had to face. The idea that Tiberius lost not a single soldier, that's an over-exaggeration. But the point is that he was very cautious, and the casualty count on the Roman side was very low. And, you know, that is far more believable. However, to many, the careful, often glacial pace of this butcher's work was not quick or flashy enough, and some ancient right. historians deride the efforts of Tiberius. Sure, some Germanic blood had been spilled, but the murderers of the legions remained unpunished after two long years. Yeah, this is not what the Roman people, or probably the Roman elite, are looking for. Tiberius, what he's doing is he's slowly pushing the line forward. Now, if we're talking about long-time occupation, that is probably the way to do things. But that's not what the people want. That's not what the Romans want. They want revenge. They want a spear right into the heart of Germania, right at the people who are responsible for this initial defeat. Tiberius, he's not necessarily the guy for that. Yet, it should be clear that this work was absolutely necessary as a first step to lay yeah, the foundation yeah. for future vengeance. Unfortunately for Tiberius, he would not be the one to taste the fruit of his toil and was mm -hmm. recalled by the emperor in 12 AD. The reason for this early departure was that the 73-year-old Augustus was in declining health. The emperor wished to have his 55-year-old heir Tiberius by his side to better manage the affairs of the empire and make preparations for a smooth transfer of power should the worst come to pass. Upon his return, Tiberius would celebrate a glorious triumph. This served to reassure the Roman people that Teutoburg had been nothing more than a one-off event, with fortune now returning to the side of the legions. It's also a good way to bolster his reputation. Like I said, I think Tiberius was sort of a mixed character. And so this is a good way right before he takes over for Augustus, because, you know, we have the power of hindsight, Augustus doesn't have much longer left, a good way to remind everybody, hey, here's the conquering hero Tiberius, remember him? Yeah, he's going to become emperor shortly. <laughs> it also helped reinforce the idea that Tiberius was a competent leader who could yeah, be trusted exactly. to take over the reins of the empire when the time came. Indeed, this careful politicking proved to be the right move, as Augustus would soon die yep. in 14 AD, a month before his 76th birthday. Tiberius Goodness. was- what a reign! A month before his 76th birthday, Augustus had ruled a stable, peaceful, and prosperous empire for decades. Now, we're not gonna go into Augustus's reign here, but truly, truly impressive. And, you know, once again, you can see why the defeat at Teutoburg was such a shock to the system. Not that it was necessarily Augustus's fault, of course, but it did sort of break into that prosperous, peaceful idea that the Romans had of their empire uh, since Augustus had really taken over as sole ruler. Now emperor. As ruler of the vast Roman lands which stretch from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea, Tiberius could spare little time personally handling matters in Germania. Yeah, Tiberius has a lot on his plate. Now, I mean, we do have a lot of emperors throughout Roman history who would personally campaign, um, especially when we deal with the Roman Empire in a diminished state. But given the circumstances, Tiberius has this large, prosperous empire to deal with. He has a lot to worry about. He's going to have to find someone else to represent him on the field, someone else to deliver Roman vengeance to Arminius and the Germans. This task would be left to one of his most brilliant and capable protégés, a 29-year-old by the name of Germanicus. The name was an honorific title that had been granted to his father, but which, as we shall see, would prove more than suited for the accomplishments of his heir. Yup, and I know a lot of y'all watching, if you're familiar with this whole saga, are big Germanicus fans. Germanicus will become a really popular figure in Roman history. He will really build his reputation 
beloved both at the time and since. So I'm excited that we get to talk about Germanicus in this series because, I mean, for the rest of this, he will be, in many ways, our main character. The young Germanicus was an important figure at the time. He was married to the granddaughter of Emperor Augustus and had effectively been made next in line to the imperial throne. Mm -hmm. As such, he was entrusted with significant administrative and military duties under the careful supervision of Tiberius. And this was exactly the kind of guy you wanted to be next in line to the throne. He was sort of this perfect candidate, and his achievements in this series will only enhance that image further. Like I said, Tiberius was more of a mixed bag, to be honest. Germanicus, he has the family ties, he's talented, he's capable, he's popular. He is a really good candidate to be next in line for the throne. And you know what? Of course, having a good emperor provides stability, but also having a good heir can really enhance that stability because people know, well, if our current emperor dies, we don't have to have this struggle or a civil war or political intrigue. We have the next person to turn to, and he's equipped for the job. Or if you hate your current emperor, if he's terrible, and over time Tiberius would become less popular, you can say, well, we just have to hold out and we have Germanicus up next, and he's going to do a much better job. So having someone like him in that position, that provides a lot of stability uh, and hope to the people, hope for the future. Germanicus served as the elder commander's right-hand man during both the Great Illyrian Revolt of 6 to 9 AD and the ensuing Germanic campaigns of 10 to 12 AD. In these matters, he distinguished himself as a charismatic general who would feature prominently in the ensuing triumphal parades, but always in the shadow of Tiberius. Thus, when Germanicus was granted Imperium to lead the campaigns of vengeance into Germania, he eagerly set off to seek the limelight that had so long eluded him. Unfortunately for the young commander, his mission would get off to a rocky start. Hmm. In the few short years between Tiberius leaving for Rome and Germanicus assuming direct command, the legions had grown rested from the toils of the frontier. This was further exacerbated by the excessive abuses of their officers, which created a vicious cycle of resentment. When news of the emperor's... Yeah, like I said, Tiberius was quite the disciplinarian, and some thought him to be maybe overly harsh. Now, they pointed out there was the argument that, you know, he fought alongside his men, he lived with them, he ate with them, all that sort of stuff, but he did develop this environment of discipline that, like I said, some thought went a little bit overboard. Germanicus, on the other hand, and... I don't want to look too much into the future, but the environment he created is a little bit different. You know, not, of course, discipline was important, but more of a youthful conquering hero. Maybe someone who was more beloved than respected or feared, right? There's a bit of a distinction there. Still respected, but there is a distinction between uh, a general or a commander-in-chief who is respected, but maybe a little more on the fear side of things and a general who is respected, but beloved as well. Death reached the frontier. The four legions of the Lower Rhine rose into open mutiny out of fear that their grievances would never be addressed. These amounted to the following list of demands. One, their promised bonuses must be paid. Mm. Two, their base salary must be increased. And three, their service length must be decreased from 20 to 16 years. And that's a real long time for us. It <laughs> shows you how they operated at the time. Uh, this is a bad sign for the future. Now, if we zoom out from this individual instance, uh, you might say, oh, well, you know, they, they should fight for extra bonuses and all that sort of stuff. They're taking on a dangerous and tough job. Sure, zoom out. These soldiers, first off, they know they're in an important decision. They are or sorry, in an important position. They are stationed along the Rhine. Uh, at this point, that might be just about the most important position in the Empire. So they know that they have leverage. Over time, stuff like this is going to keep happening. Troops stationed in these, especially in these important positions, but even troops who are maybe not stationed in such important posts, will recognize that they have leverage, and they will ask for bigger bonuses larger pay increases, you know, more and more and more over time. And even if it doesn't seem like a massive issue at this point, it will become a massive issue throughout the rest of the empire. 
For several months, Germanicus and the commanders along the Rhine were caught up in a series of negotiations with the mutineers. Eventually, it was agreed that the troops would be paid their bonuses and have their salaries adjusted. Mm. This would be generously paid out of the pockets of Germanicus himself. In addition, those who had served at least 16 years would remain in service, but be exempted from military tasks, with the exception of battle itself. This seems to have satisfied the legions, who at one point even offered to make Germanicus emperor. The young man wisely sidestepped this traitorous- This is also another problem, <laughs> is that especially as the empire becomes less and less stable, if you're just a good general, there's a good chance that your men will try to proclaim you emperor at some point. This will be another recurring theme of Roman history. This act, ...and instead decided to take on the mantle of Imperator by leading them on a fresh campaign to refocus the Roman armies and to restore their cohesion as a fighting force. Right. At this point, however, it was late in the campaigning season, and not much of substance could be accomplished. Nonetheless, Germanicus opted to make the most of the small window by launching a punitive raid on the Marsi people with utmost brutality. His armies marched across the land, burning Ugh. and slaughtering whole villages as they went. Showing not an inch of mercy, Germanicus even launched an assault against the tribes in the dead of night during a religious festival. The surprise yep. absolutely- Not an ounce of mercy. Um, I'll stop emphasizing it because I've done it several times and they're doing a good job of it, but yeah. Just keep in mind this brutality. He wiped out the target, leaving all to be massacred or sold into slavery, with not a single Roman killed. To add insult to injury, the lands of the Marsi were put to the torch, and their sacred shrines despoiled. Neighboring tribes were horrified by the sacrilege, and attempted to strike back. Yet Germanicus was prepared for such an eventuality, having deliberately provoked them with his barbaric actions. Mm. The Romans marched under full guard at all- His barbaric actions. Now, if you said that to a Roman, they would say, uh, excuse me, we are the absolute height of civility. Those Germans that you're talking about, they're the barbarians. <laughs> they would not at all recognize what Germanicus does, just did as barbaric. All times, swatting away the raids and ambushes thrown against them with impunity. Thus, the Germanic tribes were left helpless in the face of the Roman advance. Unable to stop the bulldozing juggernaut, they were forced to abandon their lands to the invader. This travesty was not just visited upon the Marsi. As the legions finally turned back towards their winter quarters, they also ravaged the lands of the Bructeri, the Tuvantes, and the Euseptes along the way. The snow began to fall on a devastated Germania. If such horrors could be wrought in the span of just a few months, what would the following year bring? Good Contemplating question. these matters, it was clear to all that Rome's vengeance was just getting started. Yeah. That was a good question, one, and uh, good point as well. All right, we're going to end it here. Uh, I'm going to be breaking this down. As uh, Invicta broke down the original videos, I'm watching the full one-hour, 40-minute length documentary, but I'm splitting it as they split the original videos because I figure that if anyone knows where to break off each part, it's probably them. So I believe that means we'll be doing this in six parts. I think that's how many parts is broken down into six. Uh, and so this was part one. We came in right at the aftermath of the Battle of the Tuberg Forest. We didn't talk much about it, but I gave you all a bit of a background. We saw the Roman response, Tiberius sent in, then, you know, recalled to play his role and fill the role of emperor and now Germanicus has been sent out, already performed some incursions across the Rhine, some brutality. We've got a long way to go from here. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope you're excited for the rest of the series. If you are, then please subscribe. And if you hit the bell button next to the subscribe button, uh, you will get notifications each time I upload. And so you get notifications to remind you whenever I release a reaction to this series. Anyway... I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you again next time. Goodbye.